Um, okay, everybody, um, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. <laughs> um, and tonight we are going to continue our study of the way of the Bodhisattva, which means we are studying Upaya, which means we're going to continue reading from our Upaya Sutra, <clears throat> from the Ratnakuta collection of sutras. Um, if you've been following along with what we've been up to lately on Sunday nights, we, I have been talking about the, what is called the career, they often use that language, so I will use that language as well, but we are talking about the career of the Bodhisattva. And this is what I've been describing as the archetypal journey of the Bodhisattva that is based on the life story of the Buddha. And a few weeks ago, or whenever I started this kind of mini series, I mentioned that in the early form of Buddhism, <clears throat> excuse me, in the early form of Buddhism, the life story of the Buddha was the history of the founder, the history of how Buddhism came to be. And in that early tradition, the life story of the Buddha was something to admire, something to respect, something to be, in a way, uh, appreciative of. But what happens in the Mahayana and the kind of the advent of the Bodhisattva path is that they look to <clears throat> the life story of Siddhartha, not as history, but as the archetypal journey that all bodhisattvas will go through. And so <clears throat> rather than studying the story of Siddhartha historically, we've been studying it allegorically. We've been studying it, again, archetype, arch archetypically in that sense. And it becomes, um, well, insofar as we are on the bodhisattva path, it becomes something for us to look to as a model for how this goes. <laughs> and so we spent one night talking about the birth of the Bodhisattva, which isn't really a birth in that way, but it has the appearance of a birth. Then we spent a night talking about what it means to leave home. And I gave us a lot of different ways of interpreting and understanding that moment when a Bodhisattva leaves home. Then we talked about sitting under the Bodhi tree, and basically what we talked about last week was what does it mean to sit under the Bodhi tree? Be, what does it mean to sit under the Bodhi tree, be tempted by Mara, and then to overcome Mara, right? And so we talked about that, and basically the one takeaway from last week is that the story of the Buddha, like sitting under the Bodhi tree and defeating Mara, the evil one, and becoming enlightened, the story makes it sound like all of that happens like in a, a really good evening of meditation. <laughs> like if, if you have a really great night of meditation, you'll defeat Mara and become a fully enlightened Buddha. My feeling about that story is that it's describing a very long process of defeating Mara, and it does not happen just overnight. But an important thing from last week is that within the Buddhist tradition, to become enlightened and to defeat Mara does not require austerities. That's a very important part from last week that. A whole part of the idea of Buddhism is that it comes out of an ascetic tradition, but it itself is not an ascetic tradition. Even though by our modern standards, to have only one set of clothes and only one kind of haircut for the rest of your life, that all sounds a little austere for our kind of like maybe our Western lifestyles in that sense. But at the time, and for many, 
to eat only once a day and wear only one set of clothes and stick to the same haircut for the rest of your life is a middle path between a harsher form of asceticism that the Buddha is saying is not required. It's the middle path between that harsher asceticism and a more loose kind of, you know, lifestyle of the world. So last week, we talked about, and I want to remind you of an interesting thing. I wouldn't say that this is important so much as it's interesting. What our sutra told us last week, which is, again, interesting, it's that it's not that Mara was actually tempting the Buddha. It was that the Buddha invited Mara and actually commanded Mara to come challenge him so that the Buddha could make a display of defeating him for everybody. He didn't have to do that, but it was all in Upaya. And that's actually kind of an interesting place to segue to tonight where we're going to begin because something that I talked about last week was about, well, actually, I'll read it to you. It was from the section about Mara. And it was about this thing where the Buddha, or I should say the Bodhisattva, because he hadn't become a fully enlightened Buddha just yet, but the Bodhisattva sitting under the Bodhi tree thinks, who is the most honored one among the realm of desire? And the Buddha or the Bodhisattva realized, ah, that's Mara, the most honored within the realm of desire. And so the idea is, is that Mara sort of only has uh, like dominion, shall we say, in the realm of desire, because that's, of course, a lot of what Mara is banking on, banking on our desire. And so you can kind of even think of this, if you would like, you, you don't need to, but you can almost kind of think of this like a video game where there's levels to this and Mara is like a boss level. I don't know if anybody plays video games out there, but Mara is like boss level, but only of the realm of desire. And so if you defeat Mara, that's only advancing you to the next level of the game, so to speak. So tonight we are now free of the realm of desire. We've defeated Mara. And now we are, at least as far as the story goes, we are fully enlightened Buddhas. And now let's find out what happens next in the story. So if you have the treasury of Mahayana Sutras, I'm on page 454, kind of towards the bottom, second paragraph from the bottom. So it says, since the Tathagata, the Buddha cultivated countless deeds and vows to give all sentient beings the joy of liberation when he trod the Bodhisattva path. So since the Bodhisattva made that vow, why did he teach the Dharma only after Brahma had asked him to do so? So, let me tell you really quickly, if you haven't heard this, again, a sutra like this, it presumes you know all of these stories already. And, and then it's kind of putting this upaya twist on them all. But if you don't know the original story, the upaya twist doesn't really mean much to us. So the original kind of account of this is that the Buddha is sitting under the tree of enlightenment, fully realized fully enlightened and basically considers now again i'm telling you the original version the buddha basically considers just hanging out and ultimately staying in a state of nirvana and passing into pari nirvana final nirvana without remainder, so nothing left at all, he's about to do that. And then 
Brahma comes. Now, if you were here last week, I mentioned that within the video game structure of Buddhism with these levels, there's the realm of desire where we're projecting onto the world, all of our cravings, all of our wants, all of our values, all of that. But then kind of underneath everything is just the world of form, just the world of the four elements, nothing to get worked up about, nothing to crave. It's just different structures of matter. And one formation of matter is not more beautiful or important or whatever than any other structure of matter. And so that's the realm of form. And the ruler of the realm of form is Brahma, the god Brahma. And if you know your kind of Hindu mythology, you will know that Brahma is the creator god, like the god that sort of creates things. And he's the creator god in that sense because he works with the four elements. So Brahma is this god of the realm of form. And Brahma comes down into the world to the Bodhi tree and begs the Buddha to go teach, tell, go tell everybody what you figured out. And the Buddha is said to have said in this original version of the story, he's basically said, nobody's going to understand this. It is just, it's beyond. And so I'll be over here in Nirvana and then I'm going to pass into Pari Nirvana and I'm out. And Brahma is said to have said, you're right, this is deep, profound stuff. But, and this is the, the like the line, the, te- the, the quote, Brahma is said to have said, but there are some people in this world with little dust in their eyes. And they'll be able to understand it. And it's for them that you should teach. And the Buddha said, you know, you're right. There are some in this world with a little dust in their eyes. So for them, I'll go teach. And boom, that kind of begins the career of the Buddha as a teacher in that way. Now, if you're not familiar with it, this phrase, of course, the dust in the eyes It's a really important Buddhist metaphor that they use a lot. And if you're not familiar with it, you can kind of miss a lot of things that are going on in Buddhism. But basically what they talk about, what they describe is that they talk about our sensory organs. And again, this is early Buddhism. So we're dealing in a very kind of primitive form of Buddhist philosophy based upon the teaching of the five skandhas wherein there are sensory organs, six in number, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain. And these sensory organs of ours are enticed by sensory things. But as I was describing with the realm of desire, it's not just that we are enticed with these things, but we're always sort of judging them, putting them into categories, putting other things above other things, and in a way, having all of these predilections and all of these desires in that way. And so the idea is, is that if I were to, what could it be? Well, it could be any number of things, but it's about how Like, it's about how we have our, again, our predilections for things and that we view things through a certain lens. And it's the lens of our past experiences. And what that means is, is that we kind of hold on to things from the past. Of course, I know we all know this, but what I mean is, is that You know, you take something like, um, you know, let's say I'm just, 
whatever. I, you know, I, I try to come up with different examples to make this interesting. So let's say, you know, as a kid on the playground, a big group of kids came and like teased me, maybe kind of like picked on me or whatever, right? So from that experience, I have this kind of, mm, I'm not really into groups. <laughs> In fact, being among a large crowd sort of gives me anxiety because of this past experience. So what that means is, is that every time I see a group of people, I can't actually see that group of people because I'm filtering that experience through the lens of my past experience. And what the Buddhists say then is that dust has settled on my mind, dust has settled on my sensory organs, and it's clouding my vision, my hearing, my smelling, my tasting, my feeling, and my thinking. So I can't really just see, and I don't want to, this is a very overused philosophical expression, the idea of seeing things as they are. It's, it, there's no as they are, but there is sort of projecting and being conditioned in that way. And so insofar as we are doing that, there's dust on our sensory organs. There's dust in, on our mind. And so at this point, you can basically be thinking about the dust as prejudice in the sense of like prejudgment. And we base those prejudgments on past experience. And again, hold on to those past experiences and then sort of filter everything through those. So the process of early Buddhism is about clearing out the dust, which is about clearing out these conditioned behaviors, conditioned ways of processing information in that sense. So the Buddha originally seems to have said that Everybody has so much dust in their eyes that there is no way they are going to understand what I'm about to tell them. Brahma says, but there's a few that have a little bit of dust. <laughs> and Buddha says, you're right. And then gets up and goes to the deer park to Ishipatana and teaches the first sutra or teaches the first sermon or the first uh, discourse. So that's the story as it's normally told, that the Buddha has his like moment of doubt. Even people even compare it to the like Jesus in Gethsemane, like when Jesus had his moment of doubt, when he was like, I don't know if I can do this crucifixion thing. And basically he decides to do it. People compare these two moments. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But after this moment of doubt and the Buddha deciding, now back to this version. So why did all that happen? Why did the Buddha teach the Dharma only after Brahma asked him to do so? Well, the Buddha, the Tathagata, knew that many gods and humans take refuge in Brahma and hold him in the highest esteem because they thought that, because they thought that Brahma had created them interesting line there. So many people hold him in high esteem because they think that Brahma created them, that he was the most, that he is or was the most venerable being in the world, and that no one except him could create the world. At that moment, knowing this, the Buddha, the Tathagata thought, now, I should just wait for Brahma to ask me to teach the Dharma because if Brahma bows to me, then the sentient beings who take refuge in him will all take refuge in me and say to one another, Brahma asked the Tathagata to teach the Dharma. He truly did so. Now, because the Tathagata had great, awesome virtue. Brahma came to him and asked him to teach the Dharma 
and to turn the Dharma wheel. Now, if I had not through my miraculous power, now this is the Buddha thinking or talking, if I had not through my miraculous power caused Brahma to ask me, he would not have come to ask because he had no intention of doing so. So in order to cause sentient beings who took refuge in Brahma to part with him, it was necessary for the Buddha to wait for Brahma to make his request. Brahma's action proved the excellence of the Buddha. When Brahma asked the Tathagata to turn the Dharma wheel, 6,800,000 gods of the Brahma heaven generated bodhicitta and said, he really is the Buddha. He is supreme, the most venerable among sentient beings. And they all made this vow. I will in a future life achieve the same wisdom and awesome virtue of the Buddha that the Buddha has achieved. And this was all the Tathagata's upaya. Okay, so we have the classic version of the story and then the upaya redux, right? This upaya revamping of it where it was all actually in upaya in order to get all of the other gods and all of the people, all the humans that worshiped Brahma to no longer worship God. Like, I really want to put this in context in terms of what they just said. Like, the Buddha's big plan was to convince everybody to stop worshiping God <laughs> and rather become enlightened and become Buddhas themselves. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> like, I really want us to appreciate what they're kind of saying in that, in that way. Now... What I do want to talk about, and, and it's actually the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors, or at least that's what I told Noam it was going to be. So the theme for tonight is turning the Dharma wheel. And we heard that reference that Brahma asked the Buddha to turn the Dharma wheel. And you've probably heard this expression before, turning the Dharma wheel. But what exactly does that mean? I got to tell you that it's one of those phrases, like, first of all, there's just the Dharma chakra, the Dharma wheel. <laughs> like, what's that? And then what does it mean to turn the Dharma chakra, right? So it actually took me a while. Nobody taught me this. It was like one of those things that none of my professors, none of my Buddhist teachers, like nobody ever told me this, but I finally kind of put it all together. It's not a big mystery, but it's, and this is not like what I'm about to say is not controversial or debated, but it's just not really made clear that often. So if you don't know, the very, very first sutra the very first teaching of the Buddha is recorded in this collection, which is called the Samyutta Nikaya, the uh, connected discourses of the Buddha. As I often mention, this is one of my favorite collections of the early sutras. And I like it actually because it's some of the oldest sutras. As I often like to point out, the Buddhists are not particularly concerned about chronology. And what I mean is, is that you would think that the first teaching of the Buddha would be like first volume, first sutra, right? But rather than being in the first volume, first sutra, it's in the fourth volume of the miscellaneous sutras and it's buried way in the back. I'm talking like last, it's, it's so far in the back. It's funny. So if you've never read the very, very first sutra, I highly recommend you do. I've done Dharma talks about it in the past. But this, of course, is the famous sutra, the famous teaching to the five bhikshus, the five shramanas, the five kind of renunciants. 
in the deer park at Ishibitana. This is right after the Buddha's become awakened. And he gets up from the Bodhi tree, goes to the deer park, finds his five old buddies, because these were five dudes that he used to hang out with and meditated with before he decided to go by himself. But he comes back, sits down with them. And the very, very first sutra basically just has two teachings. And I got to tell you that there's even versions of this where it's there's only one teaching. So the primary teaching of the very first sutra is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. Wrapped up in that teaching is sometimes the teaching of the five skandhas, the five aggregates. But the five aggregates is, is taught only as an aspect of the Four Noble Truths. And that's why in some versions, they don't even mention the five skandhas. But in this teaching about the Four Noble Truths, I want to tell you uh, something interesting. So the teaching of the Four Noble Truths is one of those teachings that it seems like every Buddhist teacher has their own interpretation of it. In particular, the first noble truth. What does the first noble truth mean? What, what even is the first noble truth? You, we, we know, we all know it has something to do with dukkha, with suffering. We know that the first noble truth is about suffering, but what about suffering? And this is where you get some teachers will say that it's a statement that life is suffering. Some other teachers I've heard mention it that no, 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 no. It's that there is suffering. That it, it's like it's a it's a reality. There's, you know, all kinds of different interpretations of what the first noble truth regarding suffering is. Even the second noble truth, the cause of suffering is a little bit tricky in terms of the way people teach the second noble truth. What is causing suffering? The second noble truth, at least as it's actually stated, is not actually about the cause of suffering. It's actually a, about the accumulation of suffering, the, like the buildup of suffering, or at least that's the way that I would teach what I'm reading. But the second noble truth is related to the suffering in some way, shape, or form. And then the third noble truth is about the cessation of suffering. And again, this is where everybody's on the same page that the third noble truth is about the elimination of dukkha the elimination of suffering. How exactly we do that will depend a little bit upon how we define noble truth number one and number two. And then number four, the noble truth number four, is about the path that leads to the cessation of the accumulation of suffering. So that's how the four kind of work together. But now let me tell you something very interesting. I haven't really had a full opportunity to mention this. So as many of you know, I work with the Chinese language. I don't know Pali. My Sanskrit is very mediocre at best. But I work with the Chinese language, and I love translating Chinese Buddhist sutras into English. And a couple of years ago, I started working with, there are a, a few, I forget exactly how many, three or four Chinese translations of the Dharma Chakra Parvartana Sutra, which is the first sutra I'm talking about, the turning of the Dharma wheel, it's called. And what I found so interesting about the Chinese versions, when I started reading the the translations of the Pali version of the sutra, I began to notice something. And then when I translated the Chinese versions, they were doing the same thing in Chinese. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. 
So I'm not going to make any, you know, claims of discovering anything. I'm going to make any categorical statements here. But I would like you to know that if you read the actual just language of the sutra, not interpretations or in that, the first noble truth, and again, this holds up in the Chinese as well. It's, it says, the Buddha says, this is suffering. And in the Pali, it's a, a demonstrative pronoun, this. And in the Chinese, it's a demonstrative pronoun, this. This is suffering. Not there is, but this. And it's this really kind of ambiguous demonstrative pronoun because what is the reference? If you think about the word this, it, it almost becomes like mystical, frankly. Because like the word this without a finger pointing at something, like just to say this, it, like the mind starts swimming in possibilities of what, what could the word this be referring to? Right? This, uh, this class. This, like, like pointing at the word itself, again, it can get mystical if you spend too long thinking about the word this, but it is what the Pali says, and it's what the Chinese says. The first noble truth is that this is suffering. Interestingly, the second noble truth is that this is the accumulation of suffering. Interestingly, the third noble truth is that this is the cessation of suffering. And number four is, and this is the path to the cessation of suffering. And this is where you get all these different teachers, including me, coming up with different interpretations of exactly what does that mean, that this is suffering, but this is the accumulation of suffering, and this is the cessation of it, and this is the path. So, one thing I could tell you, just from all of my experience studying sutras, especially even the early sutras, the, the Buddha uses demonstrative pronouns like this and that in very interesting ways. And if you're familiar at all with the early Pali-based, early Buddhist teachings on dependent origination, the Buddha is always describing dependent origination in the most simplest way, which is, if you have this, you have that. You could also understand that in the same way as saying, if you have here, you have there. And if you think about it, you can't have a here without simultaneously creating a there. You can't have a this without simultaneously creating a that. And the moment you redefine what this is, you immediately redefine what that is. As soon as you expand what here is, it changes what there is. And so the Buddha actually uses this and that to describe dependent origination. And there is a way that you could, you know, you could make a pretty strong Dharma argument for that the Buddha was pointing at this is suffering, by which he means separate, my interpretation of what he means, is by creating a this, you dualize and divide and separate what is not dual, what is not separate, but you create these artificial categories of here and there, this and that, Oh, and by the way, 
the big this is this. And when I say this, by which I mean me, as soon as I say this, I make a that, which is the world, meaning everything that is not me. This and that. And it could very well be that the Buddha was saying, thising, like if I can do that linguistically for you, like turn this into like an adverb or whatever you call those. So thising is suffering, right? Oh, and then you could think about it that if you do that, if you keep doing that, this is the accumulation of suffering. <laughs> this is also, by the way, the cessation of suffering, and this is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. How could that all be? Well, that requires, or even the possibility of thinking about that, requires us to understand what it means to turn the Dharma wheel. So an often overlooked portion of the very first sutra, it's the very end of the sutra where the Buddha has laid out the Four Noble Truths, suffering, the accumulation of suffering, the cessation of suffering in the path leading to the cessation of the accumulation of suffering, and then at the end, he says, bhikshus. I have a friend that needs a treat. <laughs> okay. If you read the end, the, B the Buddha says, bhikshus. These four noble truths or I should, let me be very careful. The language is key. The Buddha says, bhikshus, these are the four noble truths. Bhikshus, you should understand these four noble truths. And bhikshus, I have realized and understood these four noble truths. And those are called the ti pavatana, the three turnings, the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. The Dharma wheel seems to be the four noble truths, those four dharmas. And let's remember that the word dharma in Buddhism does mean like truth, right? These are the four noble truths, the four noble dharmas. And so to turn the Dharma wheel, according to the first sutra, it is to, the first movement, the first turning is for you to just know that there's these ideas out in the world, that there is like, you, you know, somebody has been talking about that this is suffering or that life is suffering, or that there is suffering. But you know, there's people talking about this is suffering. And people are talking, Buddha's talking about the accumulation, the buildup of suffering. People are talking though, about the cessation of suffering. And people are talking about there being a path. Like you should just know that there is the existence of these ideas. That's the first turning. The second turning, oh, by the way, that first turning is often called the, it has a, a Pali and a Sanskrit name, but they also just call it the indicative mode. Yeah, the indicative, indicating that there is suffering, there is a cause, there is the, uh, the cessation and there is a path, the indicative. The second turning of the Dharma wheel is what would be called the imperative that you should like it, should, it really behooves you to understand suffering what's causing its accumulation what it means for it to be in cessation and how to get there you should understand that 
So that's the second is this imperative mode of like, you should really like consider all this, not just know that these are ideas that are existent in the world, but you should understand them. And then the third turning of the Dharma wheel is called the, what do they call it? Orative, I think. Oh no, evidential, the evidential mode. And that is the mode of the Buddha who claims to have fully realized or understood suffering, its accumulation, its cessation in the path leading to the cessation. And at the very end of the sutra, the Buddha says, if I may, I might have to just paraphrase. Yeah, I'll paraphrase it, but he says, Bhikshus, it was only after turning the Dharma wheel in those three ways and have, having actually realized suffering, its cause, and so on, only then did I declare that I'm a fully enlightened Buddha. And so that summarizes the turning of the Dharma wheel. Now, my feeling about the turning of the Dharma wheel is that it doesn't need to be just the Four Noble Truths. It could be the five skandhas, it could be the six senses, it could be the seven factors of awakening, it could be the, you know, it could be any of these teachings of dharmas. But what it would mean to turn the dharma wheel would be to sort of consider any set of dharmas in these three ways. All right. So that's how I understand turning the dharma wheel. However, within the world of Buddhism, turning the Dharma wheel becomes synonymous with the beginning of Buddhism. Like the idea is, is they talk about the Buddha going to the deer park at Ishipatana and like uh, getting this baby going, <laughs> right? Like, like getting the Dharma wheel turning. And now Buddhism exists in the world and the Buddha has like turned the wheel. That's how it's used. I want you to know that if you ever hear that phrase, the turning of the Dharma wheel, they are usually referring to the event of the Buddha doing his first teaching and therefore kind of igniting this fire of Dharma that would kind of blaze forth in the world. But there is this more technical definition of what it means to turn the Dharma wheel. And it means to approach these teachings in these kind of three ways, where one, the first way we just, we just take in what is being said. The second is to like consider it more deeply as something that is important. <laughs> and then the third is to actually realize whatever Dharma is being presented. So, all right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about turning the Dharma wheel or the first sutra, Four Noble Truths. Yeah, no. Um, I don't know if it's outside the scope of this class, but uh, you, I, I don't think I've ever heard you or anyone else say that the second Noble Truth is about accumulation of suffering. Mm. And so... Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that and why it 99% uh, of the time gets interpreted as the cause, the cause or the source. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. So let's see. Yeah, so like in, in this version, it's the origin of suffering, origin, cause. Um, I suppose... I'm biased. Uh, obviously, I'm biased. We all are. I'm biased because of my um, background in the Chinese tradition. And that's because all throughout every single Chinese translation of the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, like not just the first sutra, but anytime they are referenced, as far as the Chinese were concerned, the second noble truth was about the buildup or the accumulation of suffering. And you never find this language. I mean, you find it every now and then, but it's not as prevalent of the origin. 
Now, if you really dive deeper into this gnome, it's actually the same idea. And what I mean That's is- That's what I want to understand. <laughs> like, yeah. What we're I not mean, throwing craving and 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 uh, and uh, and uh, grasping out out the window, are we? No, no, not at all, not at all. Yeah, and it's about. I would I would suggest that when the Chinese interpret this or translated this as accumulation, they seem to have in mind more of the samskaric conditioning process and so that is how it relates to clinging and attachment but it's from the like perpetual clinging and attachment so that you get this idea of the build up of it from that so yeah no we have not abandoned the idea that that's the cause yeah cool right. any other questions comments answers ideas about Cool. So I have a, uh, obviously a few more things to say. Oh, no. Uh, I think I'm on to the next one. Yeah, because what I want to say is regarding the next one. So. Actually, this is a continuation of that one, or it's just a new idea. So. Follow, follow along. I'm on page 455 now. So I have just spoken about the causes and conditions of manifesting the 10 deeds to sentient beings. In performing these 10 deeds, the Bodhisattva, the Tathagata, manifested Upaya. The wise alone can understand this. Now, you should not think that the Bodhisattva must have committed some transgressions, even the slightest ones. It would have been absolutely impossible for the Bodhisattva to sit upon the Bodhi site and attain supreme enlightenment if he had done any unwholesome things, even sl the slightest ones. And why? because the Tathagata has achieved all wholesome dharmas and has severed all unwholesome dharmas. He is free from samsara, free from karmic results, and free of the force of habit. It's absolutely impossible that he has not yet eradicated any of the unwholesome dharmas let alone that he is hindered by karmic retributions. So for the sake of sentient beings who said there was no karmic retribution and did not believe in it, the Tathagata appeared to create causes and conditions for karmic retribution. He actually had no karmic retribution, but manifested them to sentient beings so that they could think, Wow, even he, king of the Dharma, was subject to karmic results, let alone us other sentient beings. Okay, so what I want to talk about now, what I think is this is sort of part of the idea of turning the Dharma wheel in that sense. I want to talk about, well, a few things from that paragraph, but in particular, I want to talk about the idea of being free from samsara, having no karmic results, and being free of the force of habit. So those have, have been now just presented as like defining characteristics of a Buddha, that they're free of samsara, no more karmic retribution, and that they're free of the force of habit energy, or just force of habit, sorry. So samsara, of course, is the process of birth, death, and rebirth, the cyclical process of birth, death, and rebirth. And as we know, the Buddha originally set out, left home, in order to gain liberation from cyclical existence, samsara. Now, and then 
the Buddha was liberated. The Buddha was free from that and is therefore no longer in samsaric existence. The thing about that, though, is I want to kind of talk a little bit more, uh, more deeply about what is it, what does that exactly mean, right? Now, obviously, everything I say is always my understanding, my opinion, and all of that. One of the ways to think about this, so of course, our normal way, a very simple way, is the classic Indian idea of birth, death, and rebirth, that you and me are just on this much longer journey, and this particular body, this particular version, is just one of many, many, many that have been, and many and many lives that will be. That's a regular way to think about samsara. And I think it's fine. We could think about it in a more original, literal way of birth, death, and rebirth. Or we can think about it in a more kind of like, mm, kind of Buddhist way where there's like an understanding that there's no essential self or soul but there is an understanding that we are trapped in habits. We are trapped in these kind of cycles in that way where it feels like our life just keeps repeating itself and we get trapped in certain ruts. And you know, these ruts can be all kinds of ruts. They can be addictive ruts. They can be you know, just all kinds of ideas. But the idea of sort of being well, it has to do with the third of these, this idea of the force of habit. And so being trapped in a force of habit and therefore kind of being unable to get out of that cycle, of that habitual cycle. We can think about that as samsara. And we don't have to get all wild with like, next life, you're going to be a giraffe if you don't play your cards right. Like, we don't need to get into all of that. We can really just be thinking about these habits and the cyclical, like same old, same old type of idea. And a Buddha is liberated of such cyclical existence. And the thing about that is all of these teachings, especially the early Buddhist teachings, they all come back to this idea of a self. They all come down to this idea of the Pudgala, or they, it could be called the Atman, it could be called the Sattva, it could be called a Jiva, but it's this idea of the individual, the individuality. And the idea is, is that we are normally, and, and again, I always like to make this clear, these teachings, especially what I'm about to say now, are applicable to all sentient beings. If something has sensory organs and a central nervous system of any kind, then it is prone to developing a sense of individuation, a sense of being some, like, we, we know this about babies, right? That for like the first couple of months, they're like looking at their own hand, like, whoa, <laughs> like, like, what is that? Whoa, it's moving. And it takes a while for a baby to individuate that we even, even in uh, psychology, they talk about this process of individuating and becoming aware of, oh, this is me. That's not me. And that creates this sense of self. Now, that's great, especially if you're an infant trying to survive in the world. It's great if you are uh, prey, meaning other creatures are hunting you and you've got to like, you know, be on guard. You don't want to just be, you know, blissfully dissolving into the universe when a tiger's coming to get you kind of a thing, right? But so the, the point is, is that this development of a sense of individuation or self is a, you know, biological kind of necessity of survival. But all of Buddhism is dealing with 
biological conditioning, things like the desire to reproduce. Buddhism is dealing with the fact that we are biologically programmed to want to reproduce. And the point is, is that the species would have died off a long time ago if we weren't, if we didn't have this built-in desire to save the species. The point is, though, is that our biology, and the Buddha seems to have real, realized this a long time ago, our biologies didn't get the message that there's billions and billions and billions of us. And I'm not saying that this is about uh, eliminating the human species. This is not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is that our biology is not like, clued in to what's going on. It's totally operating on autopilot. And so our desire to reproduce, our desire to have sex, our desire to do all these things is a habit, conditioning. And the Buddha, Buddhism, recognizes that we are up against that conditioning. But the thing about it is that conditioning is driving us all crazy. That's the dukkha. That's the idea of the suffering, is that we have these programmed desires, and then we suffer as a result of them, not realizing that we don't necessarily need to go along with the biological programming to reproduce. We don't need to do that. We don't need to go along with the biological program of hating other people. But part of the Buddhist teaching is that that's a built-in biological reaction. And I often like to point out, all creatures, if you get too close to them, they will, they bare their teeth, they growl, they do different things. They display different forms of anger to say, get away from me, to say, you know, whatever it is. And so we are programmed to get angry as a kind of self-defense mechanism. But the point is, is that that's just a program. That's just a, a habit. And we don't actually need to be angry at everybody. But being angry, although it feels like it is a protective measure, it's actually causing our own suffering. And that's the uh, kind of an aspect of the wisdom of Buddhism that you we need to sort of realize on our own. It's an aspect of the, like, I told you about it. I told, I'm telling you about this. So that's the first turning of the Dharma wheel. The second aspect of turning the Dharma wheel is you thinking, huh, maybe I should think about not being angry. Maybe I should think about that relationship between my suffering and me being angry all the time. And then if you were to really wake up to that and realize that, and then therefore no longer have anger, but out of wisdom, because you've realized, oh, it's detrimental. This is, this anger is, it's hurting my stomach. It's hurting my heart. It's hurting the heart of my loved ones. It's hurting everybody. I thought the anger was supposed to save us all. No, it doesn't. So you could then, again, realize the nature of anger in that sense. And that would be turning the Dharma wheel those three ways. And so, boom. So the idea here is, is that samsara is that habitual cycle that we are trapped in. So to transcend it, how would we do that? According to the Buddha, we need to recognize that all of these things all of them, the anger, the desire, the sexuality, all of these different things, they ultimately stem back to that sense of self that we are either trying to defend or please and satisfy or elevate above others or whatever it is. So the liberation from the cycle of samsaric existence has to do with overcoming the attachment to the delusion of a self. And if you are free of that delusion of self, you realize, oh, 
there is no one cycling through this. It's a new, if, if we're in the Hinayana, if we're in the early tradition, we would realize, oh, it's a new being every breath. And that new being with every breath is not trapped in a cycle because it's a new being with every breath. Rather than the same old me waking up in the morning, looking in the mirror again at me and realizing, oh, I'm getting older. Oh, no. So the idea is, is that there's a lot of our thinking, if not all of our thinking, that's predicated on that idea of a self. And it's got us then trapped in the cycle. And if we just were to wake up to the illusory nature of that self, there would be no attachment to a being trapped in a cycle. So that's a quick way of thinking about samsara and what a Buddha is in terms of not being in samsara. Basically, I want to give you an understanding of how it could possibly be that there could be a being walking around and talking and eating and doing things, but without being trapped in samsara. All right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about the first, yeah, Noe. Uh, thank you, Michael. Do, your reference to the Hinayana, that every breath is a new, uh, you know, that we are born with every, uh, that a lifespan is but a single breath, which we've talked about in the past. And it, is that something it, that carries through through the Mahayana or does it? Because it, it raises that question for me. Mm -hmm. I've always, yeah, I've always, you know, I, I appreciate the lifespan story. So, mm -hmm. but you kind of separated it from Hinayana. So where are we here? Thank you. Well, let's see. Let's have fun. I'll have, let's have fun with this one. I'll try to, um, so in general, in general, it's it's difficult, Noe, with the Mahayana tradition, because you do definitely find references to the idea that we, and in fact, the, the quote, and uh, this is even a quote from a Mahayana sutra, by the way, is that the Buddha says, bhikshus, we are born, get old, and die with every breath. So that's sort of the idea, and it is found in, in Mahayana teachings. However, Noe, I would like us to appreciate the difference between the Hinayana and the Mahayana. And there's a way in which the idea of being born and dying with every breath, there's a way in which it doesn't exactly hold up in the Mahayana. And I'll explain how that is. Take something like, well, take something like breathing. So as you know, and you know, we're, this is Dharma doors, and I know many of you have been coming for a while, so I can, I can rely on your prior knowledge of a lot of these teachings. But one of the things that I want you to think about regarding breathing is it's a really so I've been trying to kind of figure out a way to talk about this idea. And what it is, is, so one of the funny things that I like to do when I'm walking, uh, maybe like a newer student, and I'm walking them through the idea of, of no self, or at least I'm walking them through questions about the nature of the self. You know, we've talked about it, like, where is the self, right? And things along those lines, right? So one of the ones that I like to mention is, is this. So these, the hairs on my arm, right? Are they inside or outside of me? And we would want to say that they are outside, because they're on the surface, right? 
And if I wanted to go inside, I would need to then like penetrate the skin and go in, right? So are we okay with this definition of, of outside, inside? So are your teeth inside you or outside you? Is your tongue inside or outside? How about your tonsils? How about your throat? Isn't the throat on the surface? And didn't we establish that if it's on the surface, it's outside? We established that, right? Well, let me, let me back up again. Are your teeth inside or outside? Tongue, tonsils, throat? Is it inside or outside? I know that you in, instinctually want to say that it's inside, but your thorax or something would be inside, right? But the throat is the exterior, isn't it? What I'm getting at, Noe, and this is more of a Mahayana thinking, I want to, what I wanted to do right now is I really wanted to kind of rattle your ideas of inside and outside of you and really push you to think about this distinction. Because if you remember maybe about half hour, 45 minutes ago, I was talking about the this and that, and that when I say this, I create a that. So this is dependent origination, that you don't get to have a, a here without a there or a this without a that. And you also don't get to have inside without outside. It, it does not compute to only talk about there being inside because you have already implied and created outside. So what I'm getting at, Noe, is that the self that we would maybe think is born and dies with every breath, that self, well, the way that I understand me versus you, me versus the world, the way that I understand that is there is a line. It's an imaginary line, but it's a, a line nonetheless. And that line has inside and outside. What I'm getting at is, is that the idea of me, the idea of myself, arises based upon the tension between a perceived internality and externality. And when I asked you about your teeth and your tonsils, I was actually trying to push you to realize that it's an arbitrary line. There actually is no inside and outside you because there's no you in that way. But thinking in terms of inside, outside is again, it's the, that's the tension that holds up that idea of self. Now, the reason why I wanted to walk us through that and kind of get us maybe thinking a little bit differently about all of that Inhale, exhale. Inhale goes inside me. Exhale goes outside me. My point is, is that the very way that we linguistically and mentally think about breathing as inhale, exhale, also is creating the illusion of there being a me that has an inside me and an outside of me that has a here and then there's a there. And the realization of the Mahayana especially is that all of these dualities are relative, not absolute. The, again, I say here, I create a there. 
But as soon as I change what here is, it changes what there is, meaning that the nature of what is here and what is there, their natures are not fixed. They are dependently originating. The self is dependently originating based upon this tension between self and other, or the perception of self and other, the perception of inside, outside. And all of that gets reinforced with this idea of <gasps> breathing in, breathing out. It's the very, the very way that we think about these things keeps reinforcing this idea of me versus you. Yet we breathe the same air, <laughs> right? There are all kinds of microbial organisms going to work in my stomach that are, are processing all of this stuff that I have eaten, right? And all of that is happening here, but there is all kinds of processes and microbes here that are feasting off of my dead arm hair. Why is it that I don't claim ownership of those microbes, but I do claim ownership of the microbes in my stomach and call them me? Why do I make that distinction between biochemical processes happening here, but not out here? Again, this is all just aspects of the mind clinging to, and you fill in the blank, clinging to this, clinging to that, clinging to self, cling, 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 clinging. So my point, uh, knowing my lo that long answer was to say that in the Mahayana, they are much more interested in the mental mechanisms that are creating this idea of self that seems to be born and die with every breath. Yeah. Cool. Fun. All right. Any, any questions or any confusion about where you are in, right, in this? You're everywhere in that sense. There, that's one way of, of interpreting what I just said, is that you're everywhere. You could also just substitute as that you're nowhere, but it works either way. Okay, so that deals with the samsara aspect. Karmic results is an interesting one. In fact, I'm going to not say so much about karmic results because it's the theme of next week's uh, Dharma Doors is talking more about like karmic comeuppance, if you will, like getting our karmic retribution. And I know that that's always an interesting topic uh, for people interested in Buddhism. And then the last of those aspects then is the, uh, the Buddha being having overcome the force of habit. And that, of course, is the, this idea of samskara, conditioned habitual behaviors. And again, just to give us like a little taste or a deeper appreciation for what a Buddha is. The basic idea of, of Buddhism, if you haven't heard, it, this is what a lot of the early Buddhist talk about the five skandhas is about, by the way, what I'm about to say. So a lot of people don't teach that there is three different kinds of samskara. So samskara is this idea of habits, conditioning, and we normally almost always when we hear about the five aggregates and we think about conditioning, we immediately think of mental conditioning. But there's actually three kinds of conditioning, three kinds of habits. Habits of the body, habits of speech, and then habits of mind and thinking. And something important to understand about Buddhism is that in terms of the body, there is a tremendous amount of activity of the body that is autonomic. 
your breathing, your heartbeat, your blinking, all of these things are just happening. You don't have to think about them. Your heart will just keep beating. Your lungs will keep expanding. And again, you don't need to do anything in order to make that happen, right? That's because your body is conditioned to do those things, right? Now, again, what I, and actually what I want to point out is that conditioning isn't exactly bad or evil because breathing is, is good in that sense, right? So the body is autonomically, habitually just doing these things. And again, I want to emphasize, and we don't even need to think about it. The second form of habits, the second form of samskara is about language. And the basic idea is that when you first, you know, your parents or elementary school, primary school, I don't know when, but whenever it was, you were first shown something that looked like that. And when you were a child, it was like, I don't know what, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to like to say it. I don't know what it means. It's like, it, it's beyond me. But at some point, somebody was like, A, A, and you got conditioned to the point where I could just show it to you and you know, you know right away. You know that it's a letter, you know what letter, you know how to pronounce it. You even know that it's a word. It's a word and a letter. And you know all of that, but you know it because you've been conditioned. We call it educated, but you could also call it conditioned. And what I want you to think about is that when your eyes go across a page of words, you do not deliberate like, wait, wait, what, what is that one again? What's that? I mean, it might be if it's like a foreign language that you're learning, but the language that you are totally conditioned in, you don't even think about. It just, you just read. Or even right now, sounds are coming out of my face and you're just, you're just hearing. You're just hearing what I'm saying. It's because you're conditioned in the English language. And just like you're breathing, you don't have to think about it. You can just talk and you don't need to think about words like, wait, what's the word again? Again, I know that for certain things you might like, how, like what's, the, what's the word for that again? But my point is, is that when we are just speaking and reading, it's a form of samskara. It's a form of conditioning. And of course, if you understand the five skandhas, and that one of the five aggregates is that you are your conditioning. Meaning part of being you is being conditioned in the English language. And what makes somebody else somebody else is they might be conditioned in Spanish and not English. And that's what would make them them and quote you you is that you are conditioned differently. Now, if you're following me on this, which is that the conditioning of the body just happens and we don't need to think about it. The conditioning of speech and hearing language, also, we don't need to think about it. Well, that brings us to the third form of conditioning, which is mental conditioning. And this is where it starts to get really wild because what Buddhism is basically saying is that when you're thinking, it's samskara, it's habits popping up, bloop, bloop, bloop. But we think we're doing it. Not that it's just a habit happening, meaning that, you know, when I say elephant, and then you maybe think of an elephant, you didn't just of your own free will think of an elephant, 
right? You were conditioned by me and by the English language that when I said that word, a little elephant bubble idea bubbled up and you didn't have any control over it. As unsettling as this might seem, thinking is habitual. And that ultimately what Buddhism is saying is that all these actions of the body, all these actions of our voice, and all these actions of the mind are just on autopilot. Every, you are just basically an automaton robot being conditioned and living out the conditioning. Now, that's not your, the only mode of being. There is enlightenment. There is Buddhahood. There is another mode of being that is unconditioned. And in fact, a Buddha is defined as being free of habit energy, free of conditioning, meaning not on autopilot, sovereign, autonomous. But what we need to do or what the suggestion is, is to really start noticing and analyzing how much of our action, speech, and thought are actually just like, you know, pardon the expression, but brain farts, right? Just boop, boop, whoops, I thought another thing. Whoops, I thought another thing. And again, it's about realizing or noticing, it's why they do the meditation. It's why the, four, or the third foundation of mindfulness is the mind. And the fourth foundation are the ideas, the dharmas, because we actually want to gain a kind of perspective on the way the mind is working and realize, oh, wow, all of this is habitual conditioned junk in that way. Okay, so that's a Buddha being free of the force of habit results of karma, which again, we'll talk about next week, and being free of samsara. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that? Yeah, Maria. So um, how does um, um, active sort of pursuit of learning fit into that in terms of um, what it sounds like you're saying is no free will or agency around around our thoughts. Um, so when we are seemingly in charge um, of our thoughts, or um, the example I'm thinking of is when we're sort of in active pursuit of trying to find something out. It seems like we're very much in charge of our thoughts at that point. So um, could you say something about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, this is a really um, interesting one. Um, yeah, one, one second. Let me grab. <clears throat> so I, had, I was mentioning earlier about um, how in the Chinese language, the second noble truth, they focus on accumulation. I'll share with you another interesting thing. This has been, um, and, and this is something that isn't about um, like just like the way the Chinese interpret it. It's something that we can learn from the Chinese Buddhists and the way that they translated this. So there's this character, Xing which means it's translated as to practice, right? And actually I, I missed drip. So this means to practice. And so, and in fact, if you like, uh, if you read the Heart Sutra, it says the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara while practicing the profound Pranyaparamita. Well, what's really interesting about this word practice and the Buddhists use this word practice. And in Chinese, again, they call it Xing. That's the same word for conditioning. In other words, 
the Buddhists recognize that when we are practicing, we are conditioning ourselves. And that's why I actually made the statement I did a moment ago where I said, we like to breathe. <laughs> so let's not judge conditioning as good or bad, but as something that's going on. And if we understand that conditioning is sort of the name of the game, we realize, oh, then my behaviors either condition me that way or condition me that way. And so you take something like lying. You take something like being deceptive. The idea is, is that when we are deceptive, we are fabricating these realities that don't exist, right? We are telling somebody something that isn't true. So there's like this reality that I know is true. And then this reality that I'm presenting to you that I know isn't true. And so that's kind of creating this kind of like mini psychosis where I'm like, I've got these two realities that I'm juggling. So the idea is, is that that, that doing that conditions us to kind of bifurcate our mind and conditions us into this kind of behavior. And it becomes self-perpetuating at a certain point. Whereas if we are honest and then we are honest again, we are conditioning ourselves to be honest, which is to be true, which is to sort of be what the Buddhists call straightforward rather than crooked. Now, the point is, is that we are kind of like, this is the way that I think of it. We are either kind of, actually, I'll tell you how I really think about it. <laughs> if you have ever seen one of those, um, they call it the, the Chinese finger trap, but it's that a tube, a little tube, usually made out of like bamboo or straw. And you, you put your fingers in. And when you try to pull your fingers out, it, it's an amazing little contraption because it gets tighter the more you try to pull out. And so to get your fingers out, you actually need to relax and move in. And I find that to be such a valuable metaphor for this whole project because we are trapped, right? We are trapped in samsara. We are trapped in the bondage of craving and all of these things. And we want out. So we, like we're just struggling to get out. And it's like, maybe if I get more money, maybe if I get this, maybe if I get that. And it's struggling to get out of samsara when in reality, we need to stop. And this is like meditation. We need to calm down, relax, and move in. Now, the idea is, is that it could be a conditioned behavior to pull, to pull. <laughs> And we could get conditioned to just react in a pulling way, but we could recondition ourselves or decondition ourselves that our default mode is to relax and move in. Rather than getting angry, we relax and chill out and be friendly, develop metta. But that would require a different conditioning for that to be the new way in that sense. So does that make sense, Maria? Oh, oh, oh no. Sorry. Uh oh, there you are. Yes. Yeah, so, so actually what we're in charge of is um, the conditioning process. So it's true that thoughts are conditioned. Um, um, occurrences, um, but where we come in is we do have the ability to influence uh, the what is arising, what it, what condition thoughts come up, um, um, and we have the ability to make those um, the pull out <laughs> response or the move in. Yep. Response. Now I, I don't want to complicate it too much. But I just want to add, though, 
but thinking that we're in charge of anything might be pulling. Right. So it's more of a not pushing forward and not going back um, sort of, um, yes, we, uh, training um, is sort of that move that um, and without um, expectation is sort of the goal. That and the key is about a goal. Go in that wholesome direction. Indeed. Yeah. The key is about striving goals. Mm -hmm. That is pulling. That's that idea of like, oh, maybe if I win this or maybe. And the relaxing and moving in is actually not needing to get anywhere <laughs> in that way. So, yep. Cool. I'm with you. Nice. Yeah, thank nice. you. Excellent. Excellent. All right, everybody. Uh, that's time. So, I'm going to conclude this session. Thank you all, as usual, for being here. Always such a pleasure.